Hello everyone and welcome to part two of our fossil fuel lecture where today we're going to talk about oil and oil spills. So petroleum or crude oil, it's a fossil fuel and just so you know all fossil fuels, they're, the word fossil is because they all come from, from long dead, like millions of years dead organic matter. Usually mostly plant matter that has been decomposed and changed over time to become the fossil fuels that we know today. So oil is just one of three, coal and natural gas are the other two. So crude oil is just a complex mixture. This is not the kind of stuff you'd want to be putting in your car. So we're going to need to refine it before we can use it. And there's a few different ways to recover your oil. One is through primary oil recovery. This is where you just like dig a hole in the ground and you can pump the oil right out. It is, this is for really good reserves that have a lot of oil. But over time, those oil wells start to run dry. And so then there's something called secondary oil recovery. And in this case, you can force more oil out by injecting fluids under high pressure in the ground. So um, oil floats on water. So if you inject water under high pressure into the ground, you can force more of that oil out. And then as those wells start to go dry, you can go to something called tertiary oil recovery, where you then use steam or uh, carbon dioxide gas. And that's even a higher pressure that can force more of that oil out. So um, in a lot of cases, wells that we thought had run dry, actually we've been able to go back to and get more oil out over time. All right, so where do you find oil? Um, you'll find these beds and if you have often over time through geologic processes the rocks can get folded and you'll find because again oil floats on water you'll find that oil will and it's less dense than rock definitely you'll find that oil and natural gas will migrate to the uh, to the tops of these layers and so if you're a geologist and you're trying to find oil you would look for these types of formations and then you might send seismic surveys into the ground to see if you get reflections that would indicate a liquid layer. And if you're lucky, that liquid layer is oil and not just water. All right, so oil, we break it down into like different quality. So the lower the boiling point means it's gonna combust easily and that's gonna be your highest quality stuff. So your airplane fuel, your gasoline is gonna be low boiling point, high quality. As you go down heating oil, this is what I use in my house, a little bit less volatile, um, but still burns readily. And it's again, how I heat my house. Diesel oil is what like trucks and buses use. Um, even less volatile and it's not, it's often dirtier than your gasoline and aviation fuel. And that's why you often see that black smoke coming out of your diesel buses and trucks. Um, and then as you go all the way down, down to petrochemicals, these don't really burn easily at all. And there are things like plastics. And so you probably know that plastics are made from oil. And, um, and these would have a very high boiling point, which is good because you don't want your plastic water bottles combusting on you. So this is just a figure from your book that shows uh, sort of the same thing only in a more graphic form. All right, so this is an old graphic, but just so you know that over time, the world oil consumption has gone up and certain places more than others. And so in the North America, 22%. I'm not gonna dwell on this slide because it is pretty old, but just in general, over that 15 year time period, we raised our world demand for oil by 27%, which is really quite large. All right, so there was, is a consortium of oil exporting countries and it's called the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries and that stands for, and it's what OPEC stands for. So they produce 43% of the world's oil, all right? So here's your members and I have a graphic on the next slide that shows that better, but it's a lot. They, these countries that make up OPEC control control a huge amount of the world's oil. And so if they operate as a block and they raise and lower prices as a block and also control supply as a block, it's, it's almost, it's not quite a monopoly, but it's a pretty big control of the oil markets. So important non-OPEC oil producers include Mexico and Canada, and that also um, the United States is a non-OPEC member. So here's a map that just shows the largest oil reserves in the world. And on top of this map, I superimposed which countries are OPEC countries. So really important for us, note that Canada is not an OPEC nation and yet they have a huge amount of the reserves. So estimated in this um, graphic by about 10%. The United States by comparison is pretty far down the list. Russia is also not an OPEC member, but look at all these other countries that can control the majority of the world's oil reserves. They are all OPEC members. All right, so I just like this one, just because you can kind of see where does oil come and go. So you can tell that the US we import it from Venezuela, we get a bunch from Canada, um, from the Middle East, you know, so you can kind of tell, look at the traffic of oil movement on the planet by looking, I can kind of stare at this one for a while, but we're gonna try to keep the lecture short. So you can always pause your video whenever you want to. All right, so where are the reserves in the United States? 
Notice the major, and this is high potential because we haven't fully explored these areas, but we have major offshore reserves. And um, just for a close in of the Gulf of Mexico, um, this, you can tell the different, see the different kinds of fossil fuels, but this graphic is from your book, so you can look it up. Um, it's in the back in the supplemental pages, and you can see it down in the lower right corner. All right, so um, a little note, this is also from Miller, that the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, which uh, President Trump has been wanting to open up, um, they don't have, it, it, it is a fairly decent size of oil reserve, but as far as what our demand is, it's not that much. So when we talk about a reserve, it would, should pretty much be an emergency only sort of thing, because again, it's a wildlife refuge and we, it would be preferable not to drill for oil up there. All right, so what are the advantages of, of oil? We've been using it for a lot of years. Um, we have a lot left um, as we go to those other methods of extracting oil and go to things like offshore oil drilling we actually have ample supply of oil. Um, it's relatively low cost compared to some other uh, fuels, energy sources. It's easily transportable, you know, as long as you don't have accidents. Um, you can put it in ships and transport it between countries. Low land use, as far as you can put, you can have these oil rigs on a piece of property and use that same piece of property for grazing and whatnot. The technology has been around for a long time, so it's well developed and we have our infrastructures built around this. So we have an efficient distribution system. All right, so disadvantages. The, the, the CO2, climate change, is one of the biggest ones. It releases a lot of CO2 when you burn it. Um, it can cause a lot of water pollution if you have leaks, et cetera, or accidents. Um, you pollute the air not just with carbon dioxide, but a lot of these fossil fuels have sulfur in them, and they, can, and they will also pollute the air. And other things as we get into, say, um, coal and whatnot, there's going to be mercury. But for oil, there's going to be a certain amount of other pollutants in that. Um, not renewable. It's not going to last forever. Right now, we, we make it cheap through large government subsidies, and that cost, what you pay for your oil, does not include the environmental costs, all right? So, um, so there are a lot of disadvantages to oil. All right, so what are some types? I bring up oil sands because it turns out that we get um, a bunch of our oil from Canada, and they have these things called oil sands, otherwise known as tar sands, um, up there. And what it is, is that you basically, rather than have a well that will gush liquid oil, you have sand that is like saturated with it. And um, through a big long process, you can, you can extract that oil and get nice oil that you can put in your cars. The problem is, is that because you have to basically tear apart your landscape to get that oil, um, you're gonna ruin your local rivers and lakes. Huge amount of CO2, both in the um, processing of the oil, and then of course, when you burn the oil, so because of that, it's very energy intensive to get the oil out of a sand compared to like a liquid oil well. Um, your net energy yield is going to be low. All right, so, but Alberta, and they kind of exploded the size of Alberta here, so it makes it look like it's taken over Montana. But way up north at Fort, Mc, Fort McMurray, they, we, they have huge tar sands up there. And then they have built pipelines and whatnot to get that oil to America and to other places. So um, in our country, we don't really have oil sands. We have something called oil shale. And a lot of it is in this area. If you've ever seen those rocks that have the really cool fish fossils in them, I think that might be a fish fossil right there, but they, they're often like pinkish colored. That is oil shale. And with a lot of effort, you can burn that too, or you can get the oil out. All right, so if you're gonna mine stuff, whether it's coal or oil shale, et cetera, you generally, you're gonna have some layer of stuff like coal or whatever down there. You're gonna have to take off the top in order to get to that. When you put that off to the side, they call that the spoil. Same stuff, it's just, they call it different things depending on whether it's still over your mineral resource or off to the side. So if you're trying to extract that oil shale, you're gonna have to take the overburden off first and when you pile it off somewhere else, it becomes spoil. And again, this slide might be better in the coal lecture, but because of oil sands and shales, we put it there too. All right, so up in Alberta, they also call it bitumen. Um, Canada and Venezuela both have this and the, but together it's more oil than in Saudi Arabia but it takes a lot of energy and a lot of water to produce this stuff. So when you think about oil sands, um, just think highly energy intensive and highly damaging to the environment. You're literally tearing apart landscapes to get at this stuff and then you're, you're ruining often your local waterways um, with pollution and then also using it in the processing. All right, so just to kind of give you a sense of it, this is a river up here and you can get a sense of the scale. This is the Athabasca River right there, running a bigger river running through there. That is a pretty major river, and you can see the size of the scarring on the landscape. This is up in Canada. All right, so oil shales, 
It used to be when we were really worried about our oil supplies, and I've taught this class when oil gas was running $4.50 a gallon, if not more, um, we were thinking maybe we're going to have to use our oil shales. Um, I don't know if that's going to be the case as we start to move away from oil for a lot of purposes, but we have a ton of it. Our Rocky Mountains have a lot of oil shale in them. So um, we would have to tear apart our Rocky Mountains to get to it, but we could if we really got desperate for oil and we could extract a lot of this stuff. We, we have our Rocky Mountains are rich with oil shale. So if you're interested, there's a link down there. You could, you could plug that in and, and watch about that. All right, so the other thing you should know about this oil and transporting oil is that um, you can put it in ships and whatnot, but you have to get it from your oil field to your ship. And one of the ways that, that we do that is through pipelines. And so the Keystone Pipeline has been uh, very controversial. Just so you know, we've had, phase, we've had other Keystone Pipelines. These here are already in existence. The controversial ones are this dotted line there, and they want to connect it to the port down here to be able to take it out through Louisiana. And there's a lot of controversy there. Um, one, this Ogallala Aquifer is an underwater aquifer that was put there during the last ice age. It is literally the drinking and irrigation water for eight states. So all of these states that border that, they draw upon that Ogallala Aquifer, they pump that water out to water their farm fields, etc. This also runs through Native American territory. And um, whether or not you can use their lands to run a pipeline through, there has been a lot of controversy over that. So um, a lot of people have been opposed to the Keystone XL pipeline. And um, if, if this were to break and contaminate the aquifer, you're talking about a huge water source and then also the destruction of Native, Native American lands, et cetera. So, um, so uh, the Congress approved the construction of it in early 2015. Obama vetoed the bill later and, um, and then Trump approved it, but it was blocked by a federal judge who struck it down. And I honestly don't know what the current status of that is, but realize that it's an ongoing controversy whether or not this other, this shortcut basically of the Keystone Pipeline is gonna get built. All right, so this is from your book, so I'm not gonna focus on it, but just realize that there is, um, your book has great trade-off slides for advantages and disadvantages of oil shale and oil sands. All right, let's move on to the cafe standards. It's really not cafe like you go drink coffee, but it's corporate average fuel economy. Um, and after the uh, 1973 oil embargo, when we had major oil shortages, they set up these, um, fuel efficiency standards. So how many miles per gallon do cars have to get? So, um, so it was 27.5 average miles per gallon for passenger vehicles and only 20.7 for light trucks. And just so you know, SUVs fall into the light truck category. So one of the reasons why SUVs were able to get much lower fuel efficiency standards is that technically they're not cars, according to the government, even though you drive, you use them as cars. So um, Obama wanted to raise those, and so he did raise it to 55 miles per gallon for new passenger vehicles by 2025. The Obama administration, I'm sorry, the Trump administration has taken that out, but states like California are saying we're going to keep going with those, and a lot of car manufacturers were too. And right now, as far as I know, that's bogged down in a lawsuit. The federal government was looking at suing California, saying you can't set your own standards, and California has set their own standards for a long time, so they're like, yes, we can. So stay tuned to that one too, as to whether or not those fuel efficiency standards are able to be held to that um, metric. All right, so, um, and again, because the standards are lower for SUVs and, and light trucks, um, SUVs have been able to get away with way lower gas mileage. And if you look at some SUVs, they were down as low as 12 miles per gallon. Um, how do they get away with that? The car companies were allowed to pay a fine rather than meet the fuel efficiency standards. And because SUVs were so wildly popular, um, they, the fines were not big enough to kind of offset the, um, um, to make it worth their while to make them more fuel efficient. All right, so um, anyway, so the average, what happened was, is that even though in general, the fuel efficiency standards were going up over time as cars became more efficient because of the increase in SUV sales, the average fuel efficiency actually dropped between 1987 and 2004, which is kind of sad. So, um, and then a lot of that's because of the rise of the SUVs. So this is really not trucks that you're seeing that huge increase, that's really SUVs um, as they became the family car. So when I was a kid, I didn't even know what an SUV was. Family car was called a station wagon. Um, and now um, family cars are SUVs. All right, so I, I just pause on this slide for a moment because um, we've had combustion engines like locomotives and the cotton gin and whatnot, like since like the early 1800s. And in 2015, we're still using the same, I think this is from Tesla's website actually. Um, 
but we're still basically doing controlled explosions in our car engines. Like, why are we still using the same technology for over 200 years? So is there a better way? So when you look at the pounds of CO2 produced, um, notice there's two different numbers, and this is kind of per person. If you're driving a single occupant vehicle, um, you're gonna get way less, you're gonna create way more pollution per person than if you put two people in your car or more people in your car. And as you go to public transportation, if you're running a bus at average capacity, um, that's going to be your average fuel efficiency um, compared to like, you know, if you're, if you've got full seats, it gets even better. So this is pollution, I'm sorry, pollution per passenger mile. So, and again, airplanes, full airplanes versus partially full airplanes. So just, if we can run buses at full capacity, we're going to be uh, saving a lot more in uh, CO2 emissions than people driving their cars on their own to work. All right. So, um, you know, when you look at the U.S. compared to Europe, we look a lot worse as far as our miles per gallon and how, how well we're doing with our fuel efficiency standards. Um, however, Europe was able to get a lot of that, up, that uh, good gas efficiency by using diesel cars. And for a long time, they thought there was something called clean diesel. But what they found that diesel being a lower quality fuel um, was actually causing other pollution problems. And then we also found out companies like Volkswagen was, were cheating on their emissions and not letting people know what they were. And so I put the butt there because realize even though this looks a lot better than the US, um, they, they have had some issues there too. But I think the US, if we hold to the Obama standards, we'll be able to bring up our fuel efficiency standards pretty quickly. All right, so I put this one in here just to show you that over time, the price of oil goes up and down with various um, things. Their OPEC can do things, there can be global recessions, there can be wars that, that can affect our oil supply. So oil is, is just controversial because there's a lot of different ways um, that the things that can make the price go up and down. All right, so what are some of those things? Instability, especially in the Middle East. Um, increasing global demand. So the China and India are demanding more of that oil because their, their economies are growing. Um, and then natural disasters. Katrina did a lot of damage to our offshore oil platforms. Um, and what's not on here, not just natural disasters, but accidents like the BP oil um, spill that happened. I think we're gonna be talking about that in this le lecture. So realize that it's not just, you might be like, well, I just won't drive my car if the price of gas goes up. But the problem is, is that almost everything you use, a lot of it is transported by truck. So I live in West Seattle. And when I used to be able to cross the West Seattle Bridge, I would see all of that stuff coming into our harbor from all these different countries and then get put loaded onto um, trucks to get shipped off to wherever in the United States. So realize that what you pay for, um, it's not just what you pay at the gas pump, but a lot of your products are shipped to you via trucks that are going to use diesel or some kind of oil to get it to you. All right, so um, driving trends. This is actually kind of cool. And that they find that um, the recession started it was that vehicle miles traveled um, have been going down. And um, a lot of Americans are now choosing to live car free. And in fact, Seattle setting up a lot of their city um, in what they call mass rapid transit corridors, where they feel like people don't need to own cars because you should be able to take mass transit. And I know um, a lot of younger people and some of my good friends, even my age, have opted not to own cars at this stage um, because they feel if they need to go somewhere, the, the rise of companies like Uber and Lyft, um, besides mass transit, have made it easy to maybe get away without a car. So what they're finding is that um, even since the recession, the per capita vehicle miles traveled is on the way down. I think we're going to see a huge drop in vehicle miles traveled because of coronavirus this year, and, and I'm not sure how that's going to last. When we get to air pollution, we'll also look at what um, that lowered amount of driving is doing to our air, and it's actually doing really nice things. All right, so again, this ends as of 2013, but the financial crisis, which struck like 2007, 2008, actually did um, really reduce our petroleum consumption. Not only were people out of work, but manufacturing, everything across the board during the recession, we're not using as much oil. All right, so this is a weird graphic, but this looks at how big are our reserves. And offshore oil reserves are worth talking about because it's where we're getting a lot of our oil. As we've tapped a lot of our on-land oil um, deposits, we're going to offshore places. So exploration for oil in the ocean, um, you need to use high amplitude seismic waves that could be potentially bad for the hearing of sea life. But there's other problems also with, with drilling for oil in the ocean. All right, so where do we have it and where do states stand on it? So um, the Obama administration approved all this area off the East Coast of the United States for oil and gas exploration. The governors of most of those states were opposed to that. Um, beforehand, the Bush administration wanted to open up these areas. Um, 
and um, which the Obama administration did not approve of. And then um, President Trump, is this is what he's proposed. And, and this is not always up to the federal government, but the states do have a say. So, and um, a lot of states oppose it because of potential pollution, accidents, leakage, et cetera. Um, states that are for it's because it does a lot for the economy. It brings a lot of jobs, a lot of money into their economies. All right, so let's talk about the bad things then. Oil spills. Um, you know, most of the oil that's spilled is, is not through big things like the Exxon Valdez or the BP oil explosion. It's actually through normal operations. So, um, you know, pipeline leakages, storage tank leakage, wa the washing of tankers, um, and then there's accidents. Okay, so like the Exxon Valdez, um, the BP oil spill, and then just, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's a lot of small accidents. All the ships that you see in the ocean that are not sailboats have hulls full of uh, oil to propel those ships. And, uh, and over time, saltwater is highly corrosive. Over time, a lot of those boats might start leaking. So there's been lots of cases in, in Elliott Bay where this has happened. So what are the bad effects? All right, you can probably guess, but you know, right away that oil can kill animals, um, volatile organics, um, that they can die immediately after an oil spill. Um, this is one of the ones I think is a little bit less known is that when the oil coats a bird or a marine mammal, they stay dry. They have an outer coat that actually protects that downy under layer, whether it's feathers in a bird or downy fur in, say, a sea otter. Um, it, it protects them. Like my cat can go out in a pouring rainstorm, come in, shake herself off, and all that downy fur underneath stays dry. When you get slicked with oil, though, that oil goes right underneath and it and it's totally soaks that undercoat, whether it's downy feathers or fur, and then the animals can actually freeze to death. And they, they're also no longer buoyant, so they can sink. So um, and it's really hard to clean that oil off of those animals. When you see rescue efforts for those animals, it's hard because you, if you clean them with soap, you might destroy the ability of that outer coat of fur or feathers to slick off that water when they're in the water or when they're in a rainstorm, et cetera. Um, heavy oil can also sink to the bottom and a lot of the stuff we like to eat in the ocean like crabs and oysters and whatnot um, can uh, get contaminated. And then the beaches, of course, the intertidal life, all the life that lives along the beaches if the oil slick reaches land. And then, um, you know, this is what they did in the Exxon Valdez. And then what they found is they went back like a decade later and spraying it with all the high powered jets made of, might have made it look clean, but the oil didn't go away. It just got driven underneath the rocks. And so 10 years later, they went back and picked up some of those rocks and the oil was all still there sitting underneath. So that was not the best cleanup method. All right, so what about that Exxon Valdez? Um, it was huge and you don't know Alaska too well, but when you look at how much of the coastline was covered, a thousand miles, I did a Google map search and a thousand miles, if you go from Seattle and drive south for a thousand miles, you get all the way to Bakersfield, California. So it's about an hour, about a hundred miles north of Los Angeles. This was a huge amount of shoreline. All right, so they spent a ton of money on cleanup and they were ruled negligent. This has been tied up literally for decades in the courts, people trying to get their money, all of the fishing industry, the tourism industry. Um, what caused it? They, they found that the driver of the Exxon Valdez had been drinking. So it's, it's basically a drunk driving accident. And, but this, this led to some changes. All right, so what they found is that if the ship had been had a double hull, and if you, whenever you have uh, ships that work in icy areas, they often have a double hull so that if you run into an iceberg, the main hull might get damaged, but the inner hull will stay intact. If you're gonna fill your ship up with oil, a double hull would also prevent, say this, this the captain ran into an island. Um, it would prevent the outer hull might get damaged, but the inner hull that holds the oil would not. So a double hull might've prevented the accident or it wouldn't have prevented the ship crash, but it might've prevented the spill. So they made a new rule saying that all new tankers would have to have a double hull by 2015. But the problem is, is that, um, you can get around it by saying, okay, we're going to have a barge, not a tanker. So you can get into semantics legally and get around that rule. Um, we used to do, or in years we, we've been actually able to be at school, we've done an oil spill lab. And really sadly, when you have an oil spill, you can only clean up maybe up to 15% of it. You can try and try, but it, once it's out, you know, so prevention is everything. So um, so again, you know, oil companies trying to get around the, the new restrictions. Um, once an oil spill is out there, it's really hard to deal with. All right, so then we had the BP oil spill. So if you watch the movie Deep Horizon, it's intense movie. Um, and uh, this was in 2010, 11 men were killed. They found that BP had taken some shortcuts with their drilling rig and some of the safety features were not functioning. And the buildup of gas on top of most oil deposits, there's a gas deposit. 
and that gas pressure built up and literally exploded the pipe. So for three months, this thing gushed and the government couldn't go in and fix it because we didn't have the deep sea capability. So only BP that had the ability to go down that deep could actually cap that thing. So it just gushed for three months and it was just this huge amount of, of oil, 4.9 bil million barrels, uh, which is 206 million gallons spilled. All right, so it was nasty. And this, we have a lot of seafood industry down there. Um, and the problem was is that the oil spill was happened in the deep ocean at the bottom of the Gulf. And so only part of it actually migrated all the way to the surface. So, um, so you know, we, there's still a lot in the ocean there that we don't know what came to the surface. We, were tr we tried to skim up and even then could not do a complete job. So all of the people who were shrimp fishermen, fishermen of various types were redeployed with skimmers to try to clean that oil off the surface. And, um, and so anyway, this, this, you know, this has kind of led to a lot of, again, lawsuits and whatnot. Um, BP spent a lot of money trying to, to help the people out that were, were hurt by this. Um, at the end of the day, there was good and bad. Okay, so total miles of shoreline, 320 miles. Um, the good news was that the Gulf Stream current runs off this coast of Florida over here and runs all the way over up our coast over to Europe. We were very lucky that the oil, for the most part, as far as we know, did not make it into the Gulf Stream. If we'd done that, it would have been spread all the way up our coast and all the way over to like England. So um, we were lucky that it was contained in the Gulf, at least, you know, except for people in the Gulf. There's just a picture, satellite picture. And so what kind of cleanup efforts were there? Um, then we did skimming where the boats went out and had these are skimmers trying to scrape the stuff off the surface. They burned some of it off. Here's a burn down here. Um, they, they had cleanup on beaches and the use of dispersants, which we're gonna talk about. Um, and then, you know, again, I think the number's probably even higher than that. It's probably still in the Gulf. So um, just, you know, a lot of it we can't see because it's down deep, um, but it's still there. All right, so what does the shoreline cleanup look like? Um, they use absorbent materials, and the problem is when you're trying to clean up a spill in water or next to water is that if it's absorbent for oil, you do not want it to be absorbent for water. So like using cotton would be terrible because it soaks up a lot of water. So you want something that's hydrophobic, meaning it doesn't like water, but oil philic, I guess it loves oil. So they use various materials. They tried skimming, shoveling it. Um, people had to wear hazmat suits. You can see when it got into the grasslands, it turns out grass and plants soak up oil pretty well to their detriment. Um, so once it gets into the plants, there's not a whole lot you can do. All right, um, once, when it's in the water, you can try to contain it with booms. So if you see these things on the surface, realize they often have a tail because there's gonna be waves and water's gonna slosh around. So you want this to, to go down so that hopefully the oil won't go underneath and contaminate on the other side. So they were trying to protect some of these little offshore islands and they put booms all the way around it to try to protect it. The bad side is, so they protect the island afterward, that's all the used boom. There's pretty much no way to clean it and redeploy it. So you pretty much now you have a huge waste issue after this oil spill. All right, so what are some other things? The dispersant. Um, core exit is something that takes the big oil droplets and breaks it up and it was highly controversial. So they were initially spraying a huge amount per day and why would BP do this um, is because if you break it up then you don't really see it anymore. So problem is, is that it's a potential carcinogen and it can, and it can bioaccumulate. So there was not a whole lot of info on it to make to know if it was safe or not. So the EPA basically was like you know what we don't think this stuff is safe we want you to stop using it. And so BP eventually decreased, but it wasn't a huge amount. Um, they were very into using it because it made the oil look like it went away. But in, at the end of the day, what it did is it broke it up into small pieces, which is maybe not a good thing either. So, um, so 1.8 million gallons, huge. All right, so what's the fallout from that? Um, you know, the EPA then later said, you know, it's no more harmful to the environment than oil itself. That may not be saying a whole lot because oil is pretty harmful, um, but that oil, if you're going to break it up into really small pieces, that means that then it can make it into the food chain. So, um, so anyway, you learned all these words in our toxicology unit, carcinogenic, mutagenic, teratogenic. Um, it's just that it's, it's nasty stuff. So we probably shouldn't have been using it. Um, so anyway, the, the count goes on. This was, uh, it may be decades, we may never know the total damage to the ecosystem, both surface ecosystems and, de and even more uh, we won't know the effect on the deep sea ecosystems. 
All right, so, um, you know, when they go to the ocean floor today, they find that there's a big thick coat of this stuff down there and there's a deep plume of oily water down there. Um, and um, two inches of oil laid and stuff on the ocean floor. And again, we just don't know um, enough. It's really hard to study the deep ocean. We don't know enough about what the, the long-term effects down there might be. All right, so, you know, just one more interesting thing. This one's not so um, big, but they find that there's actually microbes in the ocean that, that consume this stuff. And um, you can actually see this is a, a, a um, methanogen and it actually ingests the oil and can break it down. The downside is that that process consumes oxygen. So you can oxygen deplete your water. And this is a graph showing methane as that methane went down as the microbes ate it, um, the oxygen consumed went up. All right, so, um, but they might also then break it up into smaller droplets. So we realize oil doesn't really ever go away. All right, so local oil spill pictures. I think Ms. DeBrew has a friend that works in environmental consulting and she gave me these pictures. These are these sheets that you can kind of lay in the water and they soak up the oil, but not the water itself. You can put booms along the shorelines to try to protect your plants and um, as well as booms in the water. So these are Puget Sound pictures. You can use these little skimmer brushes that roll and they will pick up the oil um, and just, you know, some of the other various pictures. All right, so more recently in 2017, um, there was a collision between a tug and a barge causing a breach in the hull of the tug and 9,000 gallons of fuel. So nothing compared to like these big things like Exxon Valdez, but this is our Elliott Bay. We have octopus, we have orca, we have salmon. Um, they were putting all kinds of things in the water to try to soak that oil up. So they worked really quickly and for the most part, they pretty well contained it. All right, so what are the pros and cons of oil? It's still relatively cheap. Our economy, our infrastructure is set up around it. So that's one of the reasons why it's cheap. Um, we make a lot of things from oil products like plastics um, so that we don't, that obviously if oil went away, we wouldn't be able to, we'd have to find alternatives. Cons eventually will run out. The pollution and the environmental effects can be huge, especially when there's accidents. Um, major reserves are, you know, in politically unstable countries. Uh, so that leads to volatility. And again, accidents, that can be, that can be really harmful. So um, this is from Miller again, and you can look at your Miller book for the advantages and disadvantages. You're gonna be having to talk about solutions on the AP test. So we'll, we'll talk more about solutions down the road. All right, and then this concludes our uh, lecture on oil. Next will be part three, which will be natural gas.